Ready to film? Yep. Do you want to sit on my lap? Or do you just want to sit right there? On my lap? Okay, go for it. Oh, no, 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 no. We're not going out. Look, it's raining. It's raining so hard. Um, hello everyone and welcome back to another video. Today I am just going to get straight into it because we have a lot to do today, a lot to cover, and what was supposed to be a very, very simple video has turned into this whole thing that I have had to prepare for. So yeah, a lot of ground to cover today, but as the title says, um, we're going to be talking more about propagations and uh, my propagation video that I filmed early in my YouTube channel it was it went up it went up about a year ago or a little bit more than a year ago now and it's one of my most viewed videos one of my most commented on videos and also one of my most controversial videos in terms of like um, comments and and things like that so I was a little bit hesitant to film another propagation video but I got some good questions in. There are things that I want to cover that I didn't mention in that video. So we will do that today. Um, I've got lots of things to show you, lots of stuff to talk about, some demonstrations. So anyway, um, we're gonna pretty much spend the majority of this video in the plant room, but I just wanted to let you guys say hi to Pud really quick because it's been forever since you've seen him. Oh, hello. <laughs> I apologize he hasn't really been in a lot of videos lately, but um, he's just not really into filming. And I know that it makes you guys happy to see him, but I just, I don't ever force him to film if I can sense that he doesn't want to film. Kind of like right now. Huh. Okay, to the plant room. I am going to have my laptop next to me pretty much the entire time just because I've written down all my topics here, all of my questions and everything that I want to cover and it's kind of a lot. Um, I'm hoping that this isn't like a 10 hour long video but you never know. So um, I think a good place to start in this continuation of talking about propagations is just talking about sort of the different methods of propagation. Um, not all of them because I did cover that in my first propagation video, but I do want to talk about propagating in a prop box, propagating in perlite, and also talking about the cup greenhouse method when propagating. So I do have some examples for you. I feel like most people who are watching this video probably already know what the prop box method is. It's basically when you just have some kind of bin, whether it's a Tupperware, whether it's a to-go container, or like an actual like storage bin. Um, it's when you literally just like line it with moss or soil. It's not very common that you see a soil prop box, but um, you'll see a lot of moss prop boxes pond prop boxes, um, I've seen some LECA, I've done a LECA prop box before, and then also perlite. So it's literally just a box, you line it with the substrate and then you stick your cuttings in there and I will throw up a clip of what my prop box looks like. It's nothing fancy, it's literally just one of those like domes that you can get from like your nursery or garden store. I think the entire setup cost me like eight or nine dollars. Uh, it's all plastic, easy to wash, very lightweight, easy to store away, which is why I like something like that. My mom very recently gave me her old propagation box, which I really, really love actually. I think eventually I will try to keep my props all into this little tiny prop box because in general, I just don't really want to be propagating a ton anymore because I don't need any more plants and I'm running out of people to give them to and I just don't really have the time right now to be tending to that many props. But I do like this prop box in particular because it's tall, it's super tall. Um, there are multiple like air vents that you just twist the little this little knob things and you can sort of control how much airflow is going in and out. So I really, really like this one, but if you're not able to get something like that, which I think you can just get on Amazon, these plastic ones work just fine. We'll talk a little bit more about sort of the environment of the prop boxes in a bit, um, but first let's talk about um, the cup method. So 
I don't know where this originated or who started it, but I, I feel like this is something that has just been done for, I don't know, forever. It's not something that someone like coined or came up with. I think in general, the plant community is very resourceful in general and will find anything to use for our plants. You know, like those soup containers or soup to go containers that you get from like if you go if you order Chinese food or something or Thai food um it comes in like a really tall one I think that's the first one I ever did I did two stacked on top of each other like this but then you know I figure why not use it for like the smaller ones too but yeah this is a very very common propagation method in like the house plant world and it's one that I really really love I don't know if you guys know but <laughs> way back before the um, pandemic I was able to get like a pretty good sized pot of philodendron micans and I was propagating the crap out of it um, to sell locally and at first I had just done um, propagation in moss or propagation in water inside of a greenhouse and that was fine, but my cuttings were like 50-50. 50% 50. Um, 50 of them would root, 50% of them would die. I eventually moved to the cut method and um, it worked like a dream. It was, it kind of went from 50% success to like 90 to 95%. I really only lost a few of them. So I love this method because for one, um, it's easy to keep an eye on. You don't have to worry about moss or any substrates or anything. It's just straight water and you just literally stack two cups on top of one another and you can just tape it down. If you're worried about mold or things getting really icky, you can just poke a little hole in it. It doesn't have to be a big hole, just any kind of hole to allow airflow in and out. Uh, that helps a lot, but I generally prefer to have it completely sealed. I really like this method because not only does it activate roots like on these aerial roots that you can see but because of the super high humidity given that you're putting it somewhere like bright and warm um you're gonna find that it's gonna root like crazy along the stems like it's just gonna activate everything so this is my most uh successful way of propagating um in the cut method especially for trailing plants if you have historically struggled with propagating the philodendron micans. Try this. I promise you it'll probably work. Just don't put it somewhere dark, but also don't put it somewhere too bright because philodendron micans tends to bleach very, very easily. Um, so yeah, this is the cup method with just water. And I only added a little bit. You really don't need a lot because once it's in the environment you're going to keep it in, which hopefully is somewhere again bright and warm. That humidity is just gonna do all the work for you. So it's not like you need, like if you look at this stem right here, it's completely out of water. It's like not even in water, but I'm not worried about it at all. So there's that. And then I also have done the cut method with Pawn um, for these Alocasia Friday corms. And if you guys watched I forgot which video I would have done this, but I repotted my Alocasia Friday on camera. I think it was in my night of plant to-dos and I was able to harvest four corms that I put into um, this little vessel here and it actually already has one leaf about to fully be opened. Um, maybe I could just take this off for you guys. Oh, sorry about the... Uh, I forgot to take off my little post-it notes. This is how I organize for videos. But you can see the cut method has worked so well for this one. It's just taken off in here. All of them are awake now. I can see roots on the side and it's just beautiful in there. So I'm very, very happy about that. And I'm very happy to see that all of these look like they're gonna be pretty well variegated. If you guys didn't know, it's not 100% guarantee that your Alocasia Friday will give you variegated corms. So I was just hoping for at least one variegated corm, but it looks like I'm going to have all four. So someone up there loves me. Whew, okay. And then um, the, the last one that I wanted to show you is just this Anthurium seedling in the cut method, also in pond, um, a perlite heavy pond. 
and I wanted to show this to you guys because this is a perfect way to grow your seedlings. Seedlings tend to dry up really fast, normally because you have it in a vessel that's really small, you're not going to pot a seedling in like, like a six inch pot or something. So I have my seedlings out in the open and um, they, they just dry out so fast because the vessels are tiny. But when you enclose it into a little cup like this, it's just, you know, all that humidity, it kind of just gets recycled and you're not having to refill the water as much. And this seedling has just grown so fast since being in here and all of those roots up at the top are just so nice and fuzzy and beautiful. Um, it is going to outgrow this little cup soon. So I am planning to move it to a larger cup um, so that I can continue growing it in the cup method, but I'll need something that isn't going to sort of restrict the growth. So that is the cup method. You can basically do the cup method with any kind of substrate you want, but my favorite is using perlite, pond, and water. The next thing that I want to talk about is perlite propagation. I don't remember if I covered this in my first propagation video, but I just to my memory, I don't think I have only because perlite propagation wasn't really like my go-to prop method until very recently, but I do want to at least cover it today. I have been asked how do you use perlite as a propagation substrate? So there's multiple ways that you can you can do it. You can either use it just like you would pawn or leka and basically just, I don't think I have anything in straight, oh I do, hold on. This is actually the perfect example to show you because it needs to be watered, but this is my, oh my God, these mealy bugs. <gasps> oh, you guys, it's so bad. This is um that, alocasia luca one that i got from that store called tevin's that is like a breeding ground for all pests in the world and um it has been separated from my collection because it's been infested with mealybugs and it's everywhere like when i say everywhere i mean everywhere it's like all over the back ew these are big the antennas are so long I'm gonna hurt. That is so gross. It's everywhere. Okay, so anyway, um, let's do this quickly because I want to get this back into the containment unit. So this is a, a plant that obviously I have been propagating in perlite and it's going beautifully. These roots are taking off in here. They're very, very happy and healthy. One thing that you can do is just, again, use it like Leka or Pawn and just fill it maybe like a quarter way of like the substrate height. So for something this high, I would fill it to right about here. Um, the important thing though, is that you don't wanna just like dump water in and then call it a day. You really wanna try and like saturate all of the water in there. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use my sprayer and show you guys how I would do something like this. You wanna make sure that all of the substrate sort of gets rehydrated. And you don't want to just like pour water down one side and then call it a day. Um, you can do that because it will sort of like wick upwards and like spread all of that um, moisture. Ew. There's over spray everywhere. It's like stinky fertilizer water. Um, but I, I definitely like to try and go around if I can and just get all of that perlite nice and, and hydrated. Oh my gosh, this water stinks. Liquid gold leaf smells like butthole. So you want to just be very like intentional with the watering like you would in any no drainage vessel. But to me, the most important thing when watering your plants is just making sure that you're thoroughly wetting all of that substrate so that everything gets rehydrated. That is a bit higher than I would like. It's right about here. Whereas normally I'd fill it to about here, but I'm not super worried about it. It's in a high humidity greenhouse and I'm not worried about it rotting at all. Another way that you can use perlite um, is basically just making sure that it's wet. And I really would only recommend this kind of way if you're going to be using it in like a prop box or a very 
high humidity greenhouse like a tent or an exo i wouldn't recommend doing this on a plant that you have just like on a shelf or like something like this where it's just like a high humidity or low humidity exo there's like no doors on it but i do use this prop method for some plants that i just keep in my tent since humidity is 100 percent in there all the all the time what you want to do is make sure you have clean perlite uh, make sure it's dust free and it's easier to you can either just rinse it under water but i like to minimize how much um Perlite dust is going in my drain, so I always do a dry sift into the garbage can first and then I'll rinse it under water. You can do like a soak, you can soak it for anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes and just drain all that water out and then use it like immediately. So what you'd want to do is pot it normally like you would with any kind of substrate, but just make sure that your um, perlite is already wet and then you don't need to leave a reserve at the bottom. Perlite can actually hold a good amount of water if um, put in a very, very high humidity environment. So leaving a reserve, it, you can do it, but it's not absolutely necessary. So this perlite has actually been washed, but it's been about an hour and a half. So it's, um, I mean, it's still wet, but it's like not as wet as I would like. So for something like this, I would just take some water, run it over here again, and then use it immediately. But for this example that I want to show you, this is actually the top cutting of my philodendron sodorini. And I know it doesn't really look like a sodorini anymore. She is all grown up. She's really, um, she's big now. So I do want to get this into perlite because I eventually plan to move this to pond. Whereas before, it actually grew to this size in moss, if you'll believe it or not. But, um, Right now, it still has some of its old moss roots from the moss pole, and it does have some new water roots, which is really great because I love going from water propagation to perlite propagation. And I have some yucky old roots here that I'll probably just cut off, but I've got some nice aerial roots up here that I um, can work with in terms of getting it onto a pole right away. But I want to get it started in perlite and I just want to get it out of water because I want to get it into a substrate that can hold a little bit of nutrients and sustain some of this growth um, since it is a fast grower and I think a new leaf is going to pop out pretty soon. So for this one specifically, I am going to leave a reserve down at the bottom since it is sitting on this shelf now. If I was keeping this in my tent, I would just go ahead and use wet perlite and then stick it in here and then call it a day. But I would feel better about leaving a reserve in this. And I'm going to get it on one of um, Lauren's new moss poles and I will tell you why this is wrapped in just a little bit. I am just going to start by cleaning up some of these roots. And I'm not going to be chopping any of these yellowing leaves off because I want to allow it to do its thing and move whatever nutrients it has into the rest of the plant. Um, and I'll just wait till it is completely ready to basically fall off on its own. But when I start cleaning up a plant, I always try and remove these sheaths if I can. Just because it's more of an OCD thing. There's really no harm if you leave them. But sometimes those uh, sheaths can cover these nodes where roots will form. And it's not to say that that is going to be the one thing that stops it from rooting. But it, I, I, in my experience, it definitely slows it down. So I'm going to start by cutting off some of these roots that look a little bit yucky. And let me um, give you guys a better view of this because you don't really see my face right now. I'm gonna chop this little guy off right here. And also, um, let's see what this one is doing. I'm confused. Where does this one lead? Oh, oh, it's this one. Okay, we're gonna leave that. I'm gonna cut this one off though. Thank you to everyone who um, congratulated me on my <laughs> new shears. I think many of you guys were definitely getting to a point where you 
were about to unfollow me if I didn't get a new pair of shears already. And uh, I don't blame you. If you are no stranger to this channel, you know exactly who this little guy is. This is my trusty scraper. And I'm not going to be talking about him right this second, but I will talk about it later when um, we talk about cleaning chunks and cleaning your propagations. But for right now, I'm just going to clean this guy up before we get it transplanted. I don't want to keep this propagation out for too long because it's got some really nice water roots and water roots dry out so fast they have zero forgiveness for being out in the open. They're like fish. I have rehydrated this perlite by just running it underwater and I'm going to be potting it in this tall-ish vessel here and I need a... oh here. I'm just going to fill the bottom with a bit of perlite before I stick my pole in. So I've got the bottom filled here and I'm going to position my pole. And this is a little bit too deep. I want the pole to sit right almost like to the top of where the vessel is. So I'm not going to put it in just yet, that's what she said. But I do think that I can fill a tiny bit more, not too much. And then I'll stick my, my plant in. And what I'm gonna do is actually inoculate it with, I'm using TPS Billions right now, which is kind of my go-to right now I'm, in between TPS and Great White, and I'm still trying to use up a little bit of my Dynamico that I have left, but I really, really like the TPS one. And if you missed it in my other video where I talk more in depth about it, it smells so good. It smells like Lucas candy, but also kind of like a fish store. Oh, it smells so good. Um, okay, so, so, so. This brings me to sort of the next thing I want to talk about, and it is, um, using mycorrhizal inoculants on propagations. Um, I have seen some people just like take a fresh cutting of something that is completely rootless. It'll be like a little chunk and then they stick it in their prop bin and then they sprinkle mycorrhizal inoculants in there. And while I don't think that's harmful in any way, I think it's more so just sort of a, a waste of mycorrhizal inoculants because they can be kind of expensive. Mycorrhizal inoculants aren't just like a magic powder that you like sprinkle on like garlic powder, you know, it just makes everything more delicious. This stuff is alive. It is fungi that basically form a symbiotic relationship with your soil, with your substrate. And in order to create that symbiosis between them, it needs to be able to communicate and work with your plant. And typically that's going to happen in the root system. Um, the mycorrhizal inoculants aren't going to interact with the leaves directly or the stem directly. It needs to be in contact with the root system. And before I continue quickly, um, on new transplants, I even on like water soluble um, inoculants like the TPS, um, billions or the great white uh, I do like to sprinkle it into onto the root system or the root ball so I just sprinkled a little bit onto the roots so anyway going back to talking about mycorrhizal inoculants in order for the plant and the fungus to have any kind of relationship it requires something in return the fungus requires something in return from the plant it's not like fertilizer where you just give and give and give and then the plant takes, takes, takes. This is a symbiotic relationship, so it's like a two-way street. One isn't going to work without the other. 
talking about this relationship, um, what the mycorrhizal inoculants want essentially from the plant uh, is carbohydrates, which it gets through the photosynthesis pro uh, process. And then the plant can share those sugars with the, uh, with the fungi and the fungi in return will give the plant additional nutrients and additional water that it wouldn't otherwise have access to. And it's going to receive those things from the fungus through the, um, I, I don't know if I'm saying this right, but mycelial hyphae, hyphae? Um, mycelial hyphae, I'll throw up the name on the screen. These are basically like an extension of the root system that is can actually be more beneficial to the plant than its own root system, which is kind of crazy to think about. And the plant will be able to absorb these nutrients and absorb this water even better than it would before. So in order for this exchange to take place, the fungus is going to wait for its exchange of sugars from the plant to do this whole exchange. So basically the only way that this exchange is gonna take place is if the plant fulfills its end of the bargain, which I mentioned is sugars through photosynthesis. So the mycorrhizal fungi rely on the plant and um, the plant also doesn't really rely on the mycorrhizal inoculants, but it has a better chance of growing more healthy and um, being a little bit more resilient in whatever sort of habitat or environment it's in if it has like the defense of the mycorrhizal inoculants. So it sort of benefits both of them if they have this relationship, um, but it's not like a one-way street. It's not like the plant is just gonna continue to give the mycorrhizal fungi all of the sugars and the carbohydrates carbohydrates in return for nothing. So try and keep that in mind when you're using your mycorrhizal inoculants because I feel like a lot of people don't really truly understand and I, I still now don't truly understand um, sort of everything that goes on in this symbiotic relationship. I just really know the surface level stuff but I just don't want to see people like taking the myco and just like sprinkling it everywhere thinking it's just like this magic powder. I mean it is a magic powder but just keep in mind that it, there's more to um, this actually working than just applying it. So if you're applying it on like a rootless chunk or just like a, a stem with no roots, it's just gonna sit there but it has no way of receiving those um, those sugars because the plant is not really photosynthesizing. There's no root system for it to attach to, no root system for it to interact with. So if you would like my uneducated opinion, I think it is just a waste of your resources if you're putting them in your, you know, your props that don't have roots yet. I am not the best person to talk about mycorrhizal inoculants or mycorrhizae. So I have linked something in my description where you can read about it. And also if you haven't watched the documentary called Funta Fantastic, <laughs> Fantastic Fungi, you guys have to watch it. Um, if you are a plant lover, you will love this documentary. I almost guarantee you, you, you're gonna love it. It made me emotional, I cried. I don't know why I cried, I hardly cried. And it just made me um, appreciate my plants so much more and sort of maybe understand my plants a lot more in, in that sense as well. Um, because essentially at the root of your plant um, is is fungi and they're just so beautiful and magical and just please watch that documentary if you haven't already it is such a good watch it's so brilliantly filmed and narrated and the cinematography is beautiful i just can't say enough good things about that documentary so give that a watch and read the article or read the website that i have linked in the description it just talks a bunch about mycorrhizae and um, explains it in a way that I will never be able to explain it, at least in a way that's not incoherent. So let's continue on with this guy. So the reason I have taped, taped, the reason that I have saran wrapped this pole is because I'm actually planning to do a pond pole. In my pond mix right now, I just have coarse perlite, I have 
um, Orchiata. I have some of Ina's Pawn that I call Party Pawn, and then I also have Regular Pawn, and I also have added the tiniest bit of slow release fertilizer. This plant is like flailing around everywhere, so I'm just going to temporarily attach it to the pole just so that it doesn't sort of swing around anymore. I don't want it to break. Now here's the tricky part because the holes in this pole are actually quite big and with pawn it gets a little bit dicey in terms of how well it's going to stick. So I'm going to do this over the bin just in case it um, all comes crashing out. Okay, so I essentially want to get these roots into here right away. So what I'm gonna do is just direct it inside and I probably should have stuck the roots in before I added the pawn, but uh, it's too late now. So my advice would be to stick the um, roots in there already before you get the pawn in. And if you have saran wrap, you can literally just uh, cut holes in the saran. Ow. And then I'm just gonna go over this whole thing with the pole, with this strap. So here is the finished pole. And uh, I probably could even add a little bit more perlite here to stabilize the pole since it's wobbling a little bit. It's a very, very heavy pole since it's filled with pond. Um, if you are going to use a pond pole, I would suggest that you only do it for plants that you really don't need to move around a lot. So if it's a plant that you regularly take to the bathtub or to the sink, I would not do a pond pole just because the more you move it around, the more all of it's going to fall out. But once they kind of get settled in there, um, they're really not going to move a ton, especially if you're just leaving it where it's at and just kind of watering and then spraying. Like I mentioned when we first talked about perlite propagation, you can, and I will do that for this plant, leave about a fourth reserve in the um, in the vessel. I'm not super worried about using my spray or whatever to wet all of the perlite since all of this perlite is already wet. Alternatively, if I was putting this in like a high humidity greenhouse, I would probably just stick it in here as is and not worry about a reserve since all of this perlite is wet. Hopefully this guy takes well to the transition and gets rooting and tooting in here, but I'm glad I finally took care of this thing because it's been bothering me for a while. Now that we've covered all of the propagation methods that I wanted to cover in this video, we are going to move into sort of a topic based on a question that I got and it's basically like how do you prevent that white um, webby looking fungus or mold in your props. Uh, I don't have any active mold on any of my prop bins right now, but I do have some on a soil bin. Sorry, not on a soil bin, in a soil bin. And I'm gonna try to get it out of here without disturbing it. Let's see if I can show this to you without spilling. I know it's not the best example, but it's the best I have right now. Um, but you'll notice that it sort of looks very webby. It is like fuzzy and it tends to grow like on the surface of the substrate. And I believe this is called a saprophytic fungus and it's generally harmless uh, if it's like in your soil bin or just on the top of your, um, your vessels in really small amounts. But if you're noticing a ton of it, you may want to take a look at the plant to see if anything is going wrong, particularly with anything rotting because this type of fungus feeds on or organic decaying matter. So in my soil bin, it happens pretty often if I'm not opening it um, often, if I'm not using it often. But if I'm generally going inside of my prop bin, or my prop bin, if I'm generally going inside of my soil bin like once a week, I will 
I won't have any of this fungus. And if you do notice some in your soil and it bothers you that much, you can just pick it out. I have found that keeping these large sort of bricks of charcoal in my bin helps a lot. Obviously, I don't put it in my vessels. I just always keep it in the soil bin and I'll try and keep more than just a brick. I have another one here and I didn't buy these anywhere specific. Um, sometimes when you buy horticultural charcoal like the Wilbro brand, you will find really, really big chunks in there. So I tend to take the largest ones and then just shove them in my soil bin. So like I mentioned, saprophytic fungus or that white mold uh, fungus, it is generally harmless, but it is also very common. And um, I think it's probably one of the most common kinds of like mold that we get in the houseplant hobby. And what it's caused by is usually uh, a lot of humidity. So if you have soil that's really, really, really dense and damp and not enough light and airflow. So you can usually combat this by making sure that your substrate isn't really really like sopping wet particularly soil you don't see this fungus too much on like semi hydro or passive hydro vessels that are just sort of out i really maybe have only had it like a handful of times but i usually only see them on my moss plants tree fern fiber plants and um, soil plants if you're finding that you're having this like white mold a problem in your propagation boxes or on your props in general first off just kind of take a look at the environment you're giving it I've seen some people that have prop boxes and the water line is filled so high which really isn't necessary um, there's only so much humidity that's going to be circulating in that vessel no matter if you add this much water or this much water once that humidity reaches a hundred percent it's at a hundred percent so you really only need enough water to keep the substrate damp so if you're using something like moss if you wet the moss and wring it out and just line your prop box that really should be enough and um, every once in a while you can pop in there and give it a spray if it's dried out same with perlite if you're using wet perlite sort of like what i just talked about you can just stick the wet perlite into the prop bin and put your props in there and then seal it up that's one thing that you can look at in terms of minimizing the amount of mold the second thing you can do is use prop boxes that have very very tiny airflow holes so I use, um, let me show you. I was able to get my hands on these really nifty reptile boxes. And the reason I like them is because it already has these tiny, tiny little air, air flows, air holes so that the reptile can breathe while it's in here. And the only thing I don't like about this is the size. Um, it's great for really small chunks, but I kind of wish that I was able to get them in larger sizes. And if they did come in different sizes, which I'm sure they do, I just can't find them. To me, these would be the perfect prop box because it does not keep it at 100% humidity, which I actually don't really like in general for my prop boxes. I like to at least have some airflow going in and out, even if that means that I have to go in there like once every week and a half to give it a spray down or refill the water. I've just found that um, my humidity boxes that I try to keep at 100% they always get that mold or they just end up rotting whatever's in there. So these are really, really nice. Um, obviously, if you don't have these, you can opt for any to-go container and just poke holes in it. I would really uh, recommend getting an awl. I have used my awl so many times um, since I've gotten it. I use it to poke holes in my vessels, like my plastic vessels, so that I can hang it. I can hang plants in my tent, hang plants in my XOs. And then again, if you have takeout containers that you want to put some holes in, the all comes in really handy. So airflow is another way that you can massively reduce the likelihood of getting that white mold. And then again, not putting your prop in a dark place. So typically all of my props are in very bright, well-lit places, generally very close to a grow light. So I've got props in my Millslow down here that is right under a 10 watt grow light and then I have more props down here which is under another 10 watt grow light so very very bright very warm so if you end up putting like a prop box in a kind of like dark 
area more likely than not you're going to get a lot of mold so the next thing that we're going to cover is chunk cleaning and i am so passionate about this topic if you guys know me it is just something that i a hundred percent will never not do um you can't clean chunks and then see the rewards of cleaning the chunks and then ever go back to just like having a dirty chunk and then just sticking it in a pot or sticking it in a um in a prop box once you clean a chunk your eyes will permanently see the filth and will want to clean it so this um as i showed you guys before is my trusty scraper yes i believe this is also used in the marijuana hobby as a dab tool. I also see these being sold with nail kits and that's actually where I got mine from. So mine came in like this, I don't know, like 20 piece nail kit and I used to think it was for cuticles, but apparently it's not. But um, other people have told me this is an earwax scraper, like for people with hard wax. I don't know. It's a multi-purpose tool. So the only thing I use it for is for plants. Talking about why I clean off chunks. One, remove excess tissue that you don't need to be there. I also do it to wake up auxiliary buds and to wake up the nodes. So I've got a gloriosum here. Well, I'm assuming it's a gloriosum because I have a million bajillion gloriosum chunks all over this house but it looks like a little bubble, but you can see it's actually waking up right there. But I like to basically take a chunk like this and use the scraper to scrape at these nodes to wake it up. And it basically exposes, or it removes that first top layer of tissue and exposes the tissue underneath. And I just fully believe that this completely wakes up the plant um, and tells it like, hey, like we're being attacked. We've got to do something to continue our growth. It goes into fight or flight and it just activates either growth or it activates roots. And I actually find that on little chunks like this, more often than not, you'll typically see growth first before roots. And then if you do get roots, it comes from the, the new growth that comes out. But anyway, I just basically take my scraper and I just start scraping away at all of this like just dirt and gunk that's kind of just sitting on the plant. Let me get you a closer view. I am basically just scraping away at this sort of like black dead tissue that you're seeing flake off. And what I like to do on particularly plants that are like super, super asleep, like that don't want to wake up, I notice that if you sort of scrape away at the growth point, so the auxiliary bud right here, this is where new growth would come out. This is a very, very uh, risky game, but once you get used to it, it gets pretty easy. What you want to do is first um wet the auxiliary bud with a little bit of water and you're going to very very carefully start scraping off this top layer of like bark that has sort of grown over it and it's usually a lot easier if it's wet because it sort of makes it easier to peel off or scrape off. And you don't need to scrape the entire thing, you just need to scrape enough to expose that growth point. It's like a nipple. You just want to free the nipple. So that's all I'm going to do, just like that and he'll get a good breath of fresh air and hopefully wake up um, kind of like this guy is but in the meantime i'm just going to be scraping off some of this excess gunk just to get it clean and then um, you can either just run it under water to clean it off or you can soak it in straight peroxide hydrogen peroxide or do like a 50 50 mix of peroxide and water to get it clean um, but I'm not super worried about this one. It's pretty barky. It's not like mushy at all. 
so I'm not really seeing it necessary to um, soak it in peroxide. I do want to show you this sort of like ridge right here. So this is where your roots are going to pop out of. And sometimes I will just kind of scrape it down to where I can see the fresh layer of tissue and just sort of expose it. I've just had way better results in terms of the speed at which a chunk roots when I've done this. And you really don't need to peel back all of this this bark, you can leave it because the plant is gonna ox or the stem is gonna oxidize again. It's gonna turn dark. Um, it eventually grows back this sort of like woody outer layer. But if you're trying to wake the plant up, then yeah, you can sort of peel it back. But I would peel it back like right here because you can get some roots to form around here. And you can even do it like around here. But I'm not super worried about this stem in general because I've got this guy that's like waking up. Once it pops out enough, I'll be able to get some roots on this growth point. But um, this is like all of the like nastiness that I got off of this plant. The reason why I like to take this off is because like, let's say if you've got like this in perlite or in pond, when this gets wet, it gets mushy and it just makes it all mushy in your vessel. So for me, the cleaner that I can have it, the better success that I have at like a successful propagation and not having to worry about things like bacteria and gunkies forming. I'm so out of breath. Basically for anyone who has asked me a question about, and this was a pretty frequently asked question when I opened up questions on my Instagram was like, how do I wake up a chonk or a propagation that has been asleep for forever? And this would be my number one recommendation. It's not anything fertilizer related or even environmental, environmental, environment related. It's the source of where your plant's gonna come from. It's the stem, it's where the roots are gonna form. It's that those auxiliary buds. And I feel like I might have something else to show. So here is a, um, a chunk that has been in my water prop bin for quite some time and I actually do have some growth waking up here and I believe this was the plant that I scraped the auxiliary buds of. Like right here you can see this one that's woken up. It's like pretty clean except for the very tip and that's because I don't want to scrape it off completely. Um, but we also have this auxiliary bud right here. Um, that I can just very, very lightly scrape off. Just like that. I still have no roots on this thing, um, despite it being in water. And again, sometimes uh, you'll see the growth before the roots. That's just been my observation. I'm not super worried about trying to root this, this chunk, but if I was, then I'd go ahead and just go along each of the nodes and scrape like this. And then I can get hopefully some roots along um, these areas. But this method has just been so great for me. And it was like once I started doing it, I just couldn't go back. Not only is it fun and therapeutic, but it's very, very effective. And I'm so grateful for the people that have trusted me enough to try it. I know it kind of seems like a very scary process but it works and I've seen a lot of your guys's like rehab projects and some of your props that have finally waken up um, after giving it a good scrape and it's a great it's a great method I just it's like my favorite thing ever I could just sit here all day and clean chunks like if that was my job I would be so happy people just send me dirty chunks and then I just go to town and clean it are you joking that would be like a dream come true. Okay, anyway, I just cleaned this table and now I got it dirty again. Okay, so this is going to be a pretty big section. Um, a lot of questions came in and I kind of want to answer them in a way that makes sense. So the first thing we're gonna be talking about is when should you not propagate a plant? Whew. Okay, I can think of several reasons why you shouldn't propagate a plant or when you should not propagate a plant. I have what I think is a pretty good example here. This is my philodendron tortum and it has probably the most gigantic leaf coming in to date. Like I've never had 
a furled up leaf this large before and that stem is thick 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 it looks crazy like look at these leaves they're going all the way down the stem don't focus on my face focus on the plant look at that look at all the leaves it's like hugging the stem it's crazy okay so anyway this is a plant that i love so freaking much and i have been wanting to propagate it for a long time but until recently the nodes were way too freaking close and now i think it's like it's just growing so well that i don't want to propagate it i i don't want to disrupt it i don't want to disturb it in any way so i will not be chopping this plant but when it was smaller i was so tempted i wanted to but the nodes were so freaking close i'm gonna try my best to kind of show you guys oh my god it's a fail I have an idea. What if I use my phone? We're just gonna sync this. Okay, so you can see down here that the nodes are so tight. Like, look at this right here. It is super, super compact. And if I wanted to take a propagation before, I would need to slice so carefully right here and uh, make sure to not cut into the auxiliary bud not to cut into any stem or any of the aerial roots it was just very dicey and it wasn't until about um this leaf right here that i was able to take or that the internodes were long enough for me to cut so if i wanted to i could actually cut like right here but i'm not gonna not gonna if the nodes are too close and it's too dicey and you just might end up losing that top cut. To me, it's not worth it. I would much rather grow it out and wait for a better opportunity for it to be propagated or just not propagate it at all. I have taken some very, very dicey propagations of plants and have lost a lot of plants that way. So now I am just way more selective in who is being propagated and I'm not so quick to chop my plants anymore if I don't feel like I have a, a good section to cut. So I, I don't know. I don't really have any intentions of cutting this anytime soon. Um, I think the only time I would have cut it is like for my mom if she wanted one, but I already gave her my second tortum. So I'm probably just gonna let this guy grow out nice and big. But guys, I am so stoked to see this new leaf because I have never seen an emergent leaf this large before so we're going places ehemplo number two um this is as you can see obviously my big florida beauty she's she's so pretty i don't deserve her she's too pretty for me this is a good plant to show you because the internodes of this one are getting significantly longer as well and i have been wanting to propagate this plant for my mom for so long um, I just never got the opportunity because it was growing so compact and I don't know if I'll be able to show you because it's all covered but yeah the the nodes were so close that I could never find an opportunity to cut it but now that it's getting longer I do think I'll be able to cut it before I go home in December but I'm not going to propagate it just yet because I've got a new leaf coming so you can see this emergent guy here. Um, that is one reason I wouldn't cut is if you have, if it's actively growing, I would not chop. The only exception in my opinion are trailing plants. Trailing plants like uh, Apothos or a Heteracium var Oxycardium, they're like always gonna have new growth. There's not gonna be a time really where you're not gonna see an emergent leaf typically. On trailing plants, I just chop whenever I want to chop, but for a plant like this, I would likely wait until this has fully emerged and hardened off, and then I'll cut it right away because something like this is going to grow really fast, um, and once this hardens off, I can almost guarantee it's going to start working on another leaf. So probably once this one emerges and hardens off, I'm going to take a propagation if I'm brave enough. I'm just really, really hesitant to chop this plant, but I always say I will give my mom any plant, so uh, 
my Florida Beauty is no exception. And then the last reason why I would not propagate something is if it had an active inflow coming in that you plan to um, pollinate or collect pollen from. Uh, I learned this the hard way. I had a total like blank. Like I, I just like was not thinking rationally. I filmed this video, I think it was like rehabbing my sad anthuriums or something. And I had this phil or philodendron. I had this anthurium hybrid that I had pollinated and it took successfully. Like it actually looked, I think from my recollection that it had taken the pollen that I had given it. Um, and then I fucking unpotted it and propagated the plant. I chopped the plant and literally within a few days after that, the inflow died. So um, if you have an active flower coming in or if you have an active spadix coming in, don't propagate it because it's going to shock the hell out of the plant. Um, basically, if you have an inflow coming in, just don't do anything rational. Um, water, fertilize, give it light and leave it the heck alone. So don't make the same mistake that I did. Oh. And yeah, um, those are really the only reasons that I could think of why I would not take propagations. I have my original mandula here that is just so freaking sad. Um, I think I'm just going to undo this whole thing and make this one into a trailing basket or I don't really know. I might propagate it and give it away to um, my neighbors. But I did get a new mandula from Alice, which is somewhere in there. Um, I am going to keep the top on this one, but uh, I really don't need this many. But I do need to untangle this lovely root ball. Ugh. So while we're doing that, I am going to move into the next subtopic on taking propagations. And that is how to prevent rot. Specifically on trailing plants, I find that the time needed to callus is much shorter than something that is larger, like a thick chunk that has more exposed tissue. Um, when you have a stem that's like this big, it's not going to need like an hour to callus over. That baby's going to callus over in probably like 10 minutes. How you'll know it's calloused over is it will oxidize and turn sort of dark and become hard like this and it basically seals itself off. Um, whereas a fresh cut, obviously, it's like that nice, like fresh tissue. It's a different color, it's not brown. For trailing plants like philodendron micans, uh, philodendron, like Hartley philodendron mandula, I'm just spitting out um, trailing plants that I've propagated myself. So these ones really don't need a ton of uh, callusing, but it does require some callusing still, in my opinion. Um, I've done fresh cuts of micans and fresh cuts of mandula in a prop box without allowing it to callus, and the ratio of surviving propagations and the ones that just completely turned to mush was, it was not good. So I found that allowing it to callus over for like 10-15 minutes is very very helpful, but once that 10 minutes is up or 15 minutes, whatever, you need to get it into a prop bin right away or whatever rooting substrate it's going to be. If you leave these little teeny tiny cuts, like let's say I were to chop these into like one or two node cuttings. If I took these cuttings tonight and left it out by tomorrow morning, um, it would probably be completely shriveled and dead. So in terms of taking smaller stem propagations, shorter callusing time, but make sure you get it into a bin right away or back into some sort of hydrated environment right away. But on the plants that have like a bigger chunk or just again, have more exposed tissue, you wanna keep those out a little bit longer so so that you can let it fully callus up. I'm gonna quickly just talk about uh, rooting hormone and callusing hormone. I do use this in practice all the time. Um, I used to use rooting hormone a lot and this was when I was really, really new in the hobby and I wasn't that familiar with the plants I was working with. I wasn't that comfortable with rooting plants but now that I have been in the hobby for a few years now, I am really comfortable with the methods that I use, uh, the substrates that I use, and 
Um, I feel like I'm in a much better place in terms of not needing to like rely on something like a rooting hormone. So in my callus, I call it a callusing hormone because I don't really use this mixture to root. I actually just use it on my fresh cuts. So in my mixture, it's all in powder form. I use equal parts of sulfur powder, which you can just get at really any nursery that you go to, at least here anyway. I didn't have to like special order it or anything. Um, so sulfur powder, uh, cinnamon, I would recommend using Ceylon cinnamon rather than just the regular cinnamon that you can get at like Walmart. Although I just use regular cinnamon and then also rooting hormone. So I've used the gel rooting hormone before and I've used the powder. I don't really notice a difference in terms of which one has worked better for me. I just prefer to use the powder because my other two things that I put in this mixture are in powder form. And I don't know, I don't know if it's like a mental thing or what, but I have just found that my props have not like rotted the way that they used to in my prop bins after I started sealing both ends with that callusing hormone. So I, I really don't think it hurts. If anything, it just makes your props smell nice. Like when you open my prop bin, it smells like cinnamon. So that's what I use. Um, I don't really rely on it for rooting. Um, I know a lot of people use rooting hormone. I, I can't really say much about it because I haven't used it that much for rooting, but I know there have been plenty of people that use it with success. So sorry that I can't really chime in on that topic, but in terms of using a rooting hormone in my callusing mixture, um, yeah, I say go for it. Pudge is barking because Vince is going to get his flu shot and he is not happy that he's leaving. In terms of using this like callusing hormone on, on my props, I don't use them on all my props. I typically only use it for the plants that have like really, how, how come I've been, I've been saying meaty lately, like plants that are meaty, <laughs> meaning like they have a lot of like surface area of tissue exposed. So like, let's say if I were to chop like a huge anthurium chunk, um, I would have like this much um, flesh exposed, right? Of just fresh tissue. Whereas if I just cut this stem, I only have like a little teeny tiny amount of, um, stem that is exposed so i really don't use it on the smaller uh propagations i really only ever use it on my my much larger propagations or at least not for like these types of trailing plants like when i propagated my glorious and my milano chrysum um yeah i used the callusing hormone on it and just in case you're new here this is what the callusing hormone looks like immediately smells like cinnamon and I just basically dip the ends of the the cut parts in here and I let it sit for a sec and then I get it planted so yeah pretty easy peasy but I am going to chop this guy up so let's do that while I am taking these propagations we can talk about the next question that came in and it was I heard you're not supposed to let the ends callus because water can't be absorbed through the fresh wound. Um, this is true. So, the floors are so dirty. Let's say that I have a plant that is super, super, super duper thirsty. Typically, if I'm going to be taking the propagation, I don't really like to do it on plants that are not like super healthy or not hydrated or not looking its best. If the plant is already sort of like in a weak state, the chances of a successful propagation in terms of like keeping those leaves on is a little bit lower. Um, you wanna make sure that the plant is generally healthy, but it doesn't mean that you can't propagate plants that are not like fully like plumped up and super happy. Um, you can definitely take props of plants that are a little bit on the sad side, but if we're specifically talking about plants that are dehydrated, yes, let's say if this one was super, super wilted and dehydrated, but I really wanted to propagate it, what I would do is take my cuttings and then immediately put the entire thing into water. And when I mean the entire thing, I mean roots and leaves, stem, everything. I'll just put it in water, let it soak for a good while, then take it out and just put it in whatever vessel I was going to propagate it in. And that's because, yeah, I, I do want the plant to take in as much water as it can. But if I have a propagation that is super, super healthy and is 
really hydrated. I'm not really worried about how much water is in that plant. A good example would be like fresh cut flowers. You typically cut at an angle. You don't cut fresh cut flowers like this at the end, just like straight. Wow, these are really sharp. <laughs> you cut it at an angle like this so that there's more surface area that is exposed where water can come in through the stem. Um, same concept with plants. I would recommend cutting at an angle if you've got like a really, really super dehydrated plant. Um, but if your plant isn't dehydrated, then I would much rather callous it and not risk it rotting than worry about hydration at that point. The calloused stem is going to absorb some water, but just not nearly as much as a fresh cut stem would. But if your plant is healthy and already has like moisture in it, I that's not something that I would be super worried about at that point. But if you are, you know, worried about moisture loss, what you can do is um, allow your plant to callus and then put it into a environment uh, that's really, really high humidity. Um, since high humidity, plants can take in water through their leaves and it's not the most efficient way for a plant to get water. It actually um, requires a bit of work on their end to take in water that way but it's, it's better than nothing. So if you have it in high humidity, it's going to be able to take in some of that water through the cut stem and through the leaves. And that's how you'll find some of these like one leaf rootless, well, rootless cuttings still look very healthy and happy and don't typically die off once it puts off new growth. I would just say if you're gonna take propagations and you're not really confident in like your ability to do it, just make sure that you're doing it on a plant that is happy um, just to sort of give you the best chance at a successful propagation. Uh, make sure it's hydrated already. And if it's not, then yeah, you really don't need to let it callus up. But if you don't, um, just keep an eye on it and make sure that it isn't rotting. I did talk about, I think I talked about this in my last video, but I can do it here for example. So let's say that you don't want to let your plant callus up because you want to put it in water right away. What I would recommend is taking the prop closer to the bottom leaf like this so that you have more stem here to work with. So I'm going to submerge this. If this starts to rot, at least I have a little bit of stem to work with rather than if I cut it close to right here, that rot will overtake my only node right away. I personally have had the most luck with callusing my stems. Um, that's my preference. I would much prefer to have a healthy stem than worry about the hydration of the plant. I, it's not to say that I never take propagations from unhappy plants. I do it all the time, especially if it's like a new import. Sometimes those new imports are gonna be super wilted and just super dry. So you can watch my import video where I show you how I just soak the plant for a while. Um, something like that, if I was gonna cut it right away, and it was really, really, really dehydrated because it's been in a box for however long, then yeah, at that point, I would just cut and then put it into water because my worry at that point is that too much water loss will make all of the leaves die off. So you kind of have to make a judgment call based on um, a plant by plant basis. And then the last question in terms of this uh, subtopic is, do you add anything in your water for water propagation? Before I used to use Super Thrive, but I'm not using Super Thrive anymore. Not because I hate it or because I think it's like, like a bad product. I just found it to be a little bit unnecessary, especially since um, I wasn't using it as a fertilizer. I was just using it as sort of like an enhancer or like a stimulant for growth, but it just didn't seem worth it for me to keep it and only use it in like that very tiny amount since the payoff of using it wasn't, it didn't like blow my mind. You know, it wasn't like I noticed these insanely long, crazy root growth um, in comparison to a water propagation that didn't have super thrive so i just decided it wasn't for me i sold my bottle to someone who you know uses it more often than i do 
and um yeah i'm just using water prop now but for water propagations on plants that are a little bit more dicey like a thai constellation for example um, i did talk about this in my last video you could play around with an air bubbler they are so fun <laughs> They're so useful and I like that it's not like this whole thing that you have to buy and it's like you have to like set it up and like only keep it there. It's great because you can just move this little thing around to where you need it, who you need it for and when you don't need it you just kind of pack it up, put it into a little baggie and then tuck it away. Right now I have it running in my tent for my Wenlingeri and my Philodendron Felix which are being such biatches to root but at least those stems are super healthy and it's keeping that water nice and like not fresh. I mean, it looks a little bit murky right now, but at least, you know, oxygen is being circulated in there and I'm less worried about it than if it were to just sit in like stagnant, gross water. Since these are sort of just like extra props that I'm going to give away, I'm going to be using my Dynamico mycorrhizal inoculant because I just want to use the rest of it. Um, I'm going to be putting these props into soil since they already have proper root systems. While I'm doing that, we can still continue on the topic of oh, taking propagations. I'm so far from you guys. Can you see? So the next question sort of in this topic is, how do you prevent the original leaf from falling off on a propagation? And that's a really good question because I had this issue a lot in the beginning of the hobby, I wasn't really sure how people were taking propagations without just ending up with a freaking wet stick again. I think that there are a multitude of, is that the right word? A multitude of reasons that can contribute to like how long that original leaf will stay on. I think for one, you really should try and work with as healthy of a plant as possible. Um, more likely than not, if you have a plant that's already sort of suffering and then you go ahead and you like remove it from the rest of its root system, it'll probably die because now this plant is really just in super fight or flight mode and will more than likely work on um, new growth, whether it's root growth or new like leaf growth. And when you have new growth, on a plant that's like freshly cut like that with no root system to take in any nutrients, take in any nutrients or take in any extra nutrients, that leaf is probably gonna go. So the only thing I can say is, and you know, I really don't think that there's any method that can guarantee that the original leaf isn't gonna fall off. But what I, what I can say is that air layering is probably your best bet at taking a propagation from a larger plant and keeping that that same leaf. I think I have an example to show you. So this is my philodendron serpents. Got a beautiful new leaf coming in. So this is a form of air layering right here. So you, uh, prob you have probably seen it on Instagram where people take those um, like saran wrap and they'll wrap um, like soil or moss around a node and air layer it that way or they'll put like a cup or like a to-go um, condiment container and just sort of put something around the node to wake it up. I just chose to do this since it had a really really long stem. I wanted to be able to activate some of these um, these aerial roots along the stem so that it was easier for me to chop it and um, start a new plant all over. So this is one way that you can sort of ensure or sort of maximize your chance at keeping your original leaf when you take a propagation is if you're able to be patient enough. If you can do something like air layer it, um, I would recommend you do that first so that once the roots grow, then you can chop it and it all, it'll already have a root system of its own to work with. This little plant here, it doesn't have a super like robust root system, so I would almost guarantee that this leaf will probably fall off um, shortly after I film this video, but something l like this that has like a full root system, I am not feeling nervous at all about these leaves falling off. So it really just depends. Is it like literally a 
rootless, leafless cutting? Is it just a single node with a leaf, no roots? Um, it truly just depends. So my only recommendation is to air layer. Getting close here guys, and thank goodness because I really think I'm gonna lose my voice soon. So um, these are just extra questions that I got in that I thought were worth mentioning. Um, this first one is thoughts on fluval stratum. I have actually been wanting to talk about stratum um, on this channel for a while now. I just really wasn't sure when I'd get the perfect opportunity and I do think this is the perfect opportunity. Oh my gosh, Pudge is not happy. So if you have not heard uh, what fluval stratum is, it's basically compressed volcanic soil um, in the form of these little, little teeny tiny balls that people use um, primarily in the aquarium hobby. I actually first heard about fluval stratum when I still had my shrimp tank. Oh my gosh, Pudge is going um, not so. The reason that fluval stratum is used in the aquarium hobby is because once it's in water, well, in general, it's a very, very lightweight product. It's very, um, I believe it's very porous and it's just, it, it's able to be moved around very easily, which is why it's good for like baby shrimp for them to like sort of burrow and hide rather than if you had something like gravel, like these little teeny tiny shrimp are not going to be able to like lift up a piece of gravel, right? It can also be used in the houseplant hobby. We can go a little bit into the pros of using stratum first. Um, like I mentioned, it's lightweight and I have used it before, not a ton, but I have used it before. And just based on my experience with it, I imagine that it would be really, really great for things like seedlings and um, alocasias. Only because those roots are so fine, they're so hairline and delicate that a substrate like the choose upon is really, really heavy on it. And um, when you go to like repot or something, a lot of the times you'll see a lot of breakage. But with strata, because it's so light and it's able to move around a lot within the vessel, it's not really, really heavy on top of each other. It's great for those teeny tiny little roots. Touch. Um, another pro of this is that there are beneficial nutrients in it because it is literally a type of soil. I believe it's got like potassium, sodium, and iron naturally. And I do think that it has the ability to lower the pH of your tap water. Um, aeroids typically like slightly acidic to neutral pH. I don't know how often you guys are testing your, your water that you're using for your plants, but I'm really not the type that is worried too much about the pH of my plant, unless there's something going on with like all of my plants collectively where I'm like, okay, so <laughs> like I need to get down to the bottom of this, but um, I've only really needed to test my pH really only a few times. Here is my bag of stratum. This is a four kilogram bag and um, the first con of it is that it's so freaking expensive this stuff is not cheap it is very expensive um, I think it was about 35 to 40 dollars for this size bag so this is not a thing that you can just be using on like eight ten inch pots unless you've got it like that but I definitely don't um, so it's very very expensive so that is certainly one con whereas I can get like a, oh crap. I can get like a 12 liter bag of pond for like $50 and it's gonna last me basically forever. So um, let's take some of this out. Please don't spill this Sherman. So this stuff does degrade. It's not, you can't just use this forever and ever. It is a type of soil, it's just compressed into these little tiny balls and they do break down. You have to be very, very careful with it. So let me show you here. Actually, I'll do it over here. I'm gonna show you sort of how easily you can break one of these down. So here, I've got a little tiny one in my hand. I'm just gonna press and I chopped it in half. And look, I'm just using my fingers and now it's dust. So it does break down. It's, I've seen some people mix it. 
Oh no. I've seen some people mix this with like their pawn and I do think that it's good as a sort of additive to things like pumice and perlite but once you start to mix it and like the hard gravel is like touching this stuff it's just gonna fall apart like I have tried using it with pawn before and it was just a big fat giant mess so for that reason that's another reason I won't use Fugal Stratum is because of for how expensive it is and for it to just degrade so easily um, and break apart so easily. It's just really not for me. And another reason why I didn't really like this too much is because it is quite messy. Um, I have heard like when I was in the aquarium hobby still, um, some people were saying don't rinse it and then some people were saying to rinse it. It takes so long to get this stuff clean. I just don't have the time to sit there for hours and hours and hours and just like wait for it to get clean. So uh, you can rinse it, give it like a good solid rinse, but you're still gonna have a little bit of this black debris. And when I used it, I, I only used it for less than a year on, I think it was like two little plants. The roots were actually quite healthy and it looked really nice, but the roots were like black. Like when I took it out to repot it, they were stained black even though I rinsed it underwater and stuff and I just don't like that especially because I love seeing these bright white fuzzy roots. I know that's not the case for everyone especially if you're going to rinse yours like really well but if you're going to use it straight out of the bag your vessel is going to be black. I've also heard people say that if you're going to use stratum you don't need to fertilize and that's... why did I do that? That's just not true either. It it does not have the essential nutrients that a plant needs to be happy and healthy. So if you are using stratum, it's just like using um, something like LECA where you're gonna have to use your fertilizer, which isn't really a con, like, you know, we have to fertilize anyway, but I just wanted to point it out that like, if you're using stratum, it doesn't mean that you don't have to fertilize anymore. Yes, this has um, nutrients naturally, but not enough to sustain a plant long term. I guess my overall thoughts on using stratum is that it's it's not something that is like so, so magical that I would just splurge and like spend a bunch of money on it. Um, for me, using something like perlite or using something like pawn is just as effective as stratum so just for the cost alone it's just it yeah it's gonna be a no for me but you know if you are using stratum um and you know you want to splurge a little bit i'm not anti stratum i certainly i have stratum and i'm not using it for any plants currently but I'm not, again, it's not like I'm going to sit here and say like it's bad for your plants or like you shouldn't use it. I think it's a great medium. Um, it's just, it's just too expensive. Okay, got my mangies potted. Oh, my lanta. You guys, I've made such a large, gigantic mess here. You wouldn't believe your eyes. I'm just going to answer three questions uh, quickly. So this question is, what is your favorite and most successful propagation method? Um, honestly, it is a tie, like a solid tie between water and perlite. Perlite for me is like such a trusty method that you can use to keep an eye on the roots. Um, it's super porous, it's lightweight, uh, has it like promotes a lot of airflow within the vessel because it doesn't collapse on itself as much as like pond does. Especially if you're using something like coarse perlite, you'll see a lot of air pockets in the soil um, or in the vessel. I would show you my allocation again. That's covered in mealybug, but I really don't want to take it out. Really love that you can fertilize in uh, perlite and the perlite can hold on to some of those nutrients. Um, but I also love water propagation. I, I've mentioned this before. I know there are people that are not for water propagation. They think it's a um, sort of inferior 
way of propagating or it cre it creates weak roots but that just hasn't been the case for me personally i haven't found an issue with it so i continue to do it water propagation has saved so many of my plants there's too many to name um it's just if it works it works so i'm not going to stop doing it so those are my two go-to it's got to be water and perlite what is your recommended propagation method for hoyas Again, um, <laughs> I'm not I'm not the right person to go to in terms of Hoya care since I am the killer of Hoyas. But for me, perlite, again, is I would say my go-to for Hoyas. And I'll show you, I'll show you a success story because I do have one. First off, look at all the gnats my sticky trap caught. So satisfying. Okay, uh, this is my Hoya Velosa. <laughs> is it a Velosa? I don't know. Um, I grew this from a stick, you guys. A freaking stick. Um, I, I think it was Jing who was like, throw it away. Sticks aren't going to do anything. But I was like, I, I believe. I believe in myself. And she came alive. And um, that is all thanks to the power of perlite. So when this was just a stick, I just stuck the whole stick in perlite. Um, I did the method where it was in, it was like in a bin, pretty similar to this, maybe if not this one. I just wet the perlite. I didn't leave a reserve down at the bottom since there were no leaves. Um, I just made sure that the stem never dried out. And I think it took maybe eight months or something and I got some growth on it and now it's a two leafer and she's getting bigger. So the first leaf was kind of like deformed and wonky but the second leaf is looking really, really freaking cute. So yeah, uh, perlite for Hoyas. And then the last question is a method that you would least recommend or wouldn't try. There's not a method that I wouldn't try unless it was something really ridiculous like, like oatmeal. <laughs> but um, generally, if there's a substrate that people are liking, I will usually give it a try. Um, I don't really write anything off until I do it myself, unless again, it is sort of really, really out there, like something like oatmeal. But I will say that my least favorite or least recommended propagation method would be soil. And it's probably just user error, honestly, like just is probably my fault, but I just don't really have much luck in soil. And I don't really like that I can't keep an eye on it. Um, you know, even if it is in a clear vessel, it's harder to see what's going on in there. It's much harder to pluck out rather than if you just have it sort of sitting on LECA or sitting on perlite or something, you can sort of just like move it around a little bit and give it a check. But if you've got the whole thing buried in soil, it makes it a little bit harder to um, kind of check in and make sure things are going smoothly. So my least favorite propagation method would be soil, but it is a good propagation method if you know what you're doing. And for me, I just don't know what I'm doing. So I just stick to what I know. Whew. This is gonna be a long video, you guys. I am freaking pooped. So hopefully I touched on everything that I wanted to talk about in this video. And of course, um, you know, this is not the end and this is not the end all be all. If you have propagation methods that work for you, like if it always works for you to not let your plant callus over or to not use any callusing hormones, that I have zero problem with that. Everyone's got their own swing and this is just mine. This is what works for me and I just thought I would share it. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. I am out of breath and out of voice. So I'm gonna go. If you like this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up because it helps Pudge and I a lot on YouTube. I appreciate you all for being here. We are almost at 12,000 subscribers, which is bananas. I love you all, I appreciate you all, and I will see you in the next one.